Merci. So uh, I'll be doing it in English, so I hope that's all right for everyone. Um, so firstly, I'd like to thank you all for being here today and for accepting to be members of the jury, Senator Kadari and Nishan Prabhu. Um, and thank you for being here this morning for the audience as well. So today I'll be um, presenting to you the work of my thesis project on the clustering of the white matter tracks in the rat spinal cord based on quantitative histology. Um, so you'll learn about what that's going to be throughout the presentation because um, it's a lot of big words that might mean nothing right now. Um, so just the outline for the presentation, um, quickly we'll go over the background of the anatomy and the structure of the spinal cord, the objectives um, that we're pursuing for the study, the methods um, for the image acquisition, processing, clustering, um, the result, the, the result in the <coughs> outputs for the clustering, um, discussing those uh, results and then the conclusion and future work and improvements that we can do for the study. All right, so the spinal cord is responsible for the transmission of information from the body to the brain and vice versa. Um, it is segmented into four sections. You have the cervical, thoracic, lumbar, and sacral. And each section is also divided into um, further subsections, um, which each have unique responsibilities and roles. So for example, C1 to C8 and T1 to T13 and so on. And so what we can actually take a look at is what we're more interested in is actually the uh, neurons or the nerve cells of the spinal cord, which make up the spinal cord because um, it is these that are affected by pathologies, diseases, trauma, and which evidently and consequently affect the body um, and the bodily functions. And even more so than this, if we take a, a closer look at the, at the axon, we can, there are two distinct types of axons. Um, there are myelinated axons and unmyelinated axons. So here we have an example um, of the myelinated axon um, with a myelin sheath, which is responsible, which is a lipid layer um, that surrounds the axon that is responsible for the transmission of information or for the propagation of that information. Um, and so if we actually take a look here, you'll see that on the left side, there is, this is the unmyelinated axon versus the myelinated axon. So you see the speed of transit propagation of the uh, electrical impulse is much quicker in myelinated axons. And these myelinated axons are actually what make up the white matter of the spinal cord. And that is what we'll be investigating for this study. Um, and we also have the gray matter, which are mostly composed of unmyelinated axons. And so it is the, the reason that it's called the white matter is because of the myelin sheath, which gives it the characteristic white properties um, that we observe here versus the gray matter. And so this white matter is, can actually be, be further divided into different groupings or what are known as the white matter tracts. Um, so you'll see here that these tracts are also further divided into the sensory and ascending pathways, which means um, the the sensory inputs that the body receives sends, to the, sends it, this information to the brain. So such as pain, touch, uh, uh, cold, hot, like temperature, stuff like that. And then we also have the motor or descending pathways. These pathways um, is the information that the brain transmits to the body for movement or locomotion. And so just an example that we'll see here is kind of, we'll see that the, the tracks kind of ascend um, throughout the spinal cord to the brain. So just kind of a visual representation. And so currently right now, um, the, there are very few uh, references for the entire rat spinal cord atlas and the white matter tracts and the grouping. The main one, and I think it's the only one from what we've seen, is the Paxinos atlas. And this is the main gold standard at the moment. However, there are several um, issues that are concerning the Paxinos atlas. The first is that um, it was, it's an older study um, that was done uh, about 30, 30 to 40 years ago. Um, and it was never reproduced. So it was done on one single specimen on the spinal cord. On top of that, the techniques for the staining were manual and the labeling of the tracks were done visually based off of these staining techniques. And so like I said, on one single specimen only, and lastly, they weren't even able to identify all the uh, tracts of the white matter. 
And that's, I think, one of the most important things is that even though they did this thorough and exhaustive study, they weren't able to find everything through the staining techniques, which is important, in my opinion. And so this is an example for the level C1 of their, um, of their atlas. So they used a few, quite a few different stains for the different um, cells and, and uh, the different cells and whatever else they find within the spinal cord to try to reproduce the atlas. So this is, this is their atlas. Um, but if we look further, so again, it's the same atlas, um, we'll see that they're actually missing quite a few of the tracks. So this is from the same group, the Pexinos, um, for the mouse. Um, this is an updated study that they have, but even their mouse atlas, um, which is in the same book as the rat Pexinos, is similar to this. So here, and the tracks that they found here for this mouse Pexinos, um, what they ended up doing was they extrapolated information from the literature to um, kind of then reproduce that onto their atlas. But they still, this is still like an extrapolation. They didn't find this themselves. So this is important because then the references that we're using right now don't have all the information that we need. And so it's the same thing with the human. Um, they're missing a lot of the information, which in comparison to other resources like Grey's Anatomy, which is one of the more prominent uh, anatomical references, has a lot more of the biomatic tracks as well as the, the previous image that I've shown before. So this is why it's really important to try and be able to figure out um, what the white matter tracts are, where they are, how big they are, and so on, and the position. And so in order to do that, we um, apply clustering. Clustering organizes the data using similarities found within that, within inherent to the input data that you're using. Um, and so it is basically a form of unsupervised learning um, as it groups the data that has not been labeled or classified yet. And so there are many different types of uh, clustering algorithms um, that are widely available. Um, what we ended up doing for this study was we actually looked at three. And I'll be more, mostly focusing on agglomerate clustering because um, as you'll see in the results later on, it was the one that showed the most promise. Um, but we also did test spectral clustering and k-means clustering as well. Um, so for agglomerate clustering, um, it is the subdivision or a branch of hierarchical clustering. Um, it is a bottoms-up approach where every single data point that you're inputting starts off as its own cluster, and then it groups up together, and they merge as you go on. Um, so for example, uh, if we look in the GIF here, there were two points that, that merged together. These two points merged together, merged together, and then it looks at kind of the closest points together to merge them, and, and starts from bottoms up all the way to uh, one cluster at the end. And so you can cut it off at different points um, to have multiple clusters. So that's kind of the principle behind agglomerate clustering. Um, and another important factor with agglomerate clustering, especially with the uh, sklearn algorithm that we use, um, is the adjacency matrix or the connectivity matrix. Um, this matrix allows for the spatial resolution to be prominent within the clustering. So it will be more, one, more efficient for the uh, al clustering algorithm to go through. But secondly, um, it, it'll also have a more, it, it'll, be, it'll be better for the axons. So the adjacent axons, it'll be able to classify them better. So for the, for the resultant uh, clustering outputs at the end. And so for clustering itself on the white matter, there aren't many studies that look into this. Um, in even these two studies by Benjamin and Al and uh, Saf and Al, both um, their pro the, the main focus of their study was not the clustering. It was kind of an add-on at the end that they looked at it. Um, but both of them were looking at something completely different with a diffusion MRI. So uh, Benjamin and Al, diffusion MRI data, they use a K-means clustering on their data to try and just look at the, the clustering output. And Asaf and Al, um, they did the same thing on diffusion MRI data, um, but they also looked at histology, which is interesting. Um, so they stained it with different stains, and then they compared the hist histological clustering to their diffusion data clustering. So there, the, you'll see that it's, a, it's kind of messy all over the place, especially on the histology, which theoretically should be the ground truth, and which we should be able to have um, better understanding. And then the more prominent use of clustering, especially anatomically, is for brain clustering. 
um, for brain parcellation and for the uh, fiber tracks, the white matter fiber tracks in the brain. Um, so we'll see this study that investigated three different types of clustering uh, algorithms on fMRI data. And we'll see this study by Zhang and Al that um, looked at hierarchical, hierarchical clustering on diffusion MRI um, for the brain fiber tracks. And there were a lot more studies um, in brain than compared to spinal cord. And so with that being said, we wanted to try and implement a clustering algorithm that would be able to organize the white matter tracks of the spinal cord. Um, and then we wanted to obtain these groupings using quantifiable data. So I'll, I'll go into more detail about what, what our input data will be later on. Um, but we're looking at kind of the axon diameter, axon density, myelin thickness, uh, myelin volume fraction, axon volume fraction, and G ratio as our input data. And then lastly, um, once we got these, the our clustering outputs, we wanted to try and implement some sort of um, quantifiable validation method. Um, because what's the point of having the clusters if you, can't, if you don't know if they're right, if they're in the right position or not? Um, and so to do this, um, we first, we had five rats, um, two females, three males, uh, aged between two to five months. And what we ended up doing was we perfusion fixed them first with a 3% power formaldehyde, 3% glutaraldehyde solution to extract the spinal cord, which we then post fixed in the same solution for two days, um, washed in the phosphate buffer solution for two days, stains um, with osmium tetroxide for a minimum of five hours. So this is the important step because this is what will allow us to visualize the myelin um, with the scanning electron microscopy. Um, dehydrated in kind of varying acetone baths from 25% to 100% concentration, 30 minutes each. And then embedded and polished the, uh, the samples um, to 0 0.05 micron grit and then gold coated which is also important for the visualization, or else we would get um, a lot of noise with the, with the images. To be able to acquire the image using scanning electron microscopy at high resolution, so 200x magnification with 130 nanometer resolution um, with individual tiles, which we would then stitch together using the Fiji stitching software and MATLAB script to get a whole image. And once we had this image, the next step was to segment the image. Um, using the axon seg software, which is developed by our lab. Um, so it's an in-house in software um, that was developed by uh, previous students so that we could segment the axons and the myelin, which you can see here, in order to be able to obtain our metric maps, which I had spoken about earlier, the six metrics um, that we use as our, input as our inputs, um, which we had to downsample because if not, the processing times would be really long. Um, from which then we created the white matter mask so that we could have a generated template using the ANTS uh, template construction script so that everything's transformed into a common space, which we can then apply onto all of our other uh, metric maps to get a kind of average symmetrized clean data from, for every single level, from C1 to S4. And so once we have these, these will be the inputs that we're using for our clustering. Um, and so, like I said, just the example here we're using is agglomerate clustering. We also did this with k-means and spectral, which uh, you see the results for after. Um, but basically, we're looking at the inputs, which is the number of clusters. So we use um, a varying a number of clusters from 5 to 29. Um, this is because, so theoretically, based on the literature, it should be around 15, 16, depending on um, how, what the clustering is taking in. Um, but we know that the number of white matter tracts are around 13 to 14, um, within, within the human at least, and then it should be very similar within the rat or, or, and the mouse. Um, but we wanted to kind of see the spread and the variation between the beginning to the end. So we use this for 5 to 29. Um, for the affinity, we use the Euclidean. Basically, this is just um, the distance calculation between the points. So Euclidean distance, straight line distance. Um, connectivity matrix, which I mentioned earlier, we created a connectivity matrix off of our data, which, um, which we use as an input into the algorithm, which uh, takes it in. So it was, it was really simple to do with that. And then the linkage is the, we use is Ward. 
um, linkage basically measures how the clusters are going to be merged. Um, ward linkage just uh, minimizes the variance between clusters. There are a few different types of um, linkages that we could use. I tested all of them to see which one would get the best one. Um, ward gave clearly the best results, and so it was the easiest to use and implement. Um, which we, so then once we have that, we applied this onto our input data, our six metric maps. Um, validated with this silhouette score. We also use an, another um, score, which I'll show the results for later on, the Davies Bolton score. Um, both are intrinsic uh, validation methods. So what this means is that um, they, they, they validate the clusters based off the clustering alone. Um, based off of distance. So, so that score measures the data points within uh, the cluster and compares it to external clusters to see how well that data point sits within, within the cluster. Um, the Davies Bolden index looks at the, how well the clusters are separated. So you can also have external validation, which would mean comparing it to a gold standard. Um, but the issue is since we're kind of investigating at this point, we don't know how well the gold standards would measure and we don't have, we don't kind of have like a digital representation of those to be able to map onto our uh, points to be able to compare our clustering with. So those are kind of the two methods um, available. And then lastly, we get our clustering outputs um, with an example score. Um, so you'll see that we did it on half spinal cords. Um, this is because uh, since we symmetrize left right symmetry, um, it was just better for computing time and it would make more sense to do it on the half spinal cord. Um, but I did do it on full spinal cords as well to kind of uh, see and look at the results. And so if we look at the results, um, so these are the metric maps that I was talking about. We have the six metric maps, but this example here, you'll see um, we have basically everything from the entire spinal cord length, C1 to S4. Um, we have the, so this is for the axon density. And then we have example axial slices across for C3, T6, L1, S1. Um, you'll see that um, what we're basically looking for is the, the variation of the metrics across the entire spinal cord slice. So you see, for example, here in the cortical spinal tract, um, we have a much higher axon density in comparison to the other tracts. And so this is kind of the information that we want to use um, to be able to um, have to be able to cluster on. So this is what we're relying upon, basically, that, that variation within, within the metric maps. And so we'll have this for all of our other metrics, the axon diameter, axon volume fraction, uh, G ratio, and the amount of thickness as well. And the amount of volume fraction on top of that. And so we can take a look actually at an example of our clustering outputs. So like I mentioned, we went from five to 29. Um, what we were kind of investigating and looking at here is the, uh, the evolution of the clusters as we increase and to see where they end up uh, going and how they separate and so on as, as we go from five to 29. Um, and furthermore, um, for clusters, we will also want to look at the validation scores. So, and the, the kind of the propagation between them. So you'll see that at five clusters, we have a slow score of 0.426, um, which the closer to, is the one is the highest you can get for the silhouette score. And then you'll see that when we're looking at uh, cluster 29, you'll see it's 0.353. So obviously the more clusters that you have, um, especially if, if it's taking into account kind of sparse pixels here and there, it's going to decrease um, with the score. Um, and then for the Davies Bolden, it's the same thing. We want to be closer to zero for the Davies Bolden. So you'll see that it's a lot smaller at five and then a lot higher at uh, 29. So it's kind of the things that we're looking at and that we're investigating um, when, when looking at the validations plus the evolution of the clusters. And so the next thing that we can actually look at is the, um, the difference between the, the different clustering algorithms um, that we inputted. So you'll see for agglomerate clustering, so I, I did it for 10, 11, we'll have it up till 15. But you'll see that for agglomerate clustering, the clusters are a lot larger um, and they seem to be more stable and consistent throughout. 
Uh, whereas for cumin's clustering, you'll see that it's a lot more um, varying. It'll take a lot of smaller pixels across the edges and the borders. And for spectral clustering, this is an issue that we had. And um, I'm still trying to resolve it to see what could be better. But essentially, it's kind of, it takes the largest tract as kind of background. So it kind of clusters the background, the largest tract, and the gray matter all as the same, um, which makes it difficult for it to actually cluster properly. So this is, this is an issue that we saw. So you'll see here that at 13, it, it looks a bit better, but then it goes back. So and it'll be clustering a lot on the smaller scarce pixels. Whereas for a glomerular clustering, you'll see that even when it takes into some of the scarce pixels or like the smaller pixels around the edges, it'll do it in clumps. Whereas for a key means, it'll do it in, in individual pixels and same with the spectral clustering. So this is kind of one of the reasons that uh, we ended up going into glomerular clustering. It seemed more stable. Um, and every time we ran it, it, it looked, it, it kind of gave the same uh, uh, results uh, as opposed to k-means and spectral clustering. And another thing that I wanted to show was the clustering per rat. So our, all of our um, results that I showed you previously was done on, on the average cross five rats. Um, but here you'll see that I wanted to investigate the variation on a per rat basis to see see what the difference was. Um, one of the things you'll see and you'll notice is that it's actually um, not the same. So this is all for the same level for C1. So theoretically, they should be the same. Um, this could, there are a few uh, reasons why this could be. And I, th I'll, I think I'll go into them later on in the discussion. But it mostly has to do with sample preparation is, is, my, is my hunch. Um, but you'll see that there is, there is a variation in the way the clusters are, are being formed um, in the different areas as well. If we look at uh, ventrally, anteriorly, or posteriorly uh, as well, in comparison to the uh, average. And then, so what we wanted to do next was then try and compare this to the, what we have right now, the gold standard um, that everyone is using for the rat spinal cord. Um, and you'll see that we do have similarities um, between, between, the, between the tracks. So if we're looking at uh, between C3, T6, L1, S1. Um, the, the divisions are good for the most part. But you see that if we're looking at, for example, uh, L1, it's less divided in the posterior area. So, so some of the smaller tracks are not being seen as well. Um, same thing with S1. So that's one of the, the things that we're seeing right now is that it's not, it's not complete. But for a lot of the larger tracks, we're seeing that it's, it's very similar. Um, and we also see that, um, like I mentioned, the Paxinus rat atlas isn't complete. And so what we do see is that we are getting a lot of clustering uh, results with, um, in the anterior portion where there sh we should be seeing more tracks, um, whereas the Paxinus atlas, rat atlas doesn't show. So this could also be a good sign showing that we're actually getting tracks that should be there, um, which I, I think is, is promising to, for, for our results for the most part. And so, yeah, like I said, through visual investigation, um, the agglomerate clustering is, was quite good in comparison to, to the uh, literature. Um, what we do see is that uh, based on the validation metric scores, which I didn't show for spectral or uh, k-means, but spectral seem to have a higher uh, score overall. Um, but as you saw, the results didn't look that good um, on a visual basis. And that's one of the, I guess, drawbacks with, um, with the validation metrics is that even if it gives a better score, it might not be exactly what we're looking for um, based off of what we already know from the priors uh, in the literature. And then, so yes, yeah, so then some of the limitations um, that I had mentioned that could be the reasons we're seeing variations in the clustering is that, so some of the smaller tracks were less well-defined in our clustering. Um, so this could be um, actually due to the image resolution and segmentation. So our segmentation software was only able to capture uh, axons greater than one micron. Once it started getting to the, around the one micron uh, area and less, it started um, not segmenting them as well. Um, and so if we maybe have higher image resolution and higher uh, so we also did downsample. So maybe if we, we didn't or we did it at a less uh, reduced uh, sampling rate, 
we can maybe get um, these smaller tracks in, in our clustering. Um, and as we actually saw here, there are some tracks that are overlapping. So this is one of the limitations is that we wouldn't, kind of, we wouldn't be able to have the overlapping tracks um, visualized in, in our clustering outputs right now. So that's something else that we need to uh, take a look at. Um, and as I mentioned, so sample preparation could have played a part in biasing the cluster results, which could have been um, why we saw differences in, in, in the between rats uh, clustering results. Um, so the sample preparation, um, either due to um, the penetration of the osmium tetroxide or uh, just uh, wear and tear of the samples, um, we would get holes, we would get um, kind of spots within within samples that could have biased the clustering outputs. So that's something, that's something else that um, we, we should test and look at to see if we can get samples that are whole and apply this on, on those samples to see if we get the same results or not. Um, and then, uh, so I mean, with all with all the clustering outputs that we saw, we, we saw that the um, they were all not that robust to outliers. So they were taking in smaller pixels around the edges and so on. And so this is something else that we, we need to take into account and to look at. And then the optimal cluster. So like I said, there was a spread between five to twenty nine clusters, um, but we couldn't really use the validation metrics to choose the best cluster number, even though we tried. So right now, everything is kind of a visual basis um, because the quantitative basis right now isn't um, as precise or clear. And so to conclude, um, for the future work that we have, and these are things that I'm in the process of implementing right now, um, we're trying to look at a correlation between uh, along the Z as well, um, because we know that in, in maybe not for the entire spinal cord, but at least for a few slices between like C1 and C2, for example, um, on a Z level, on a 3D level, the axons could correspond. So we want to see if, um, if basically we can get the same positioning of the clusters um, when we apply it, if we're doing a registration, for example, um, on one, one single image, and then trying to apply the clusters on that to see if we get um, to, to get similar results because of the uh, continuity of the axons on the Z level. Um, and another method of doing that would be the multi-layer networks, um, which is basically applying an adjacency network, but uh, in, in the Z direction, instead of just looking at it in 2D. Um, and then uh, something else that I actually want to test would be to implement this on other histological data sets. Um, so other either rat data that might be more clean than ours um, at higher resolution. Um, as well as other species to see if we can kind of reproduce what we're seeing in the literature or what, what kind of things that we will observe. And as well as on, I think eventually, if we can kind of optimize this perfectly to be able to apply this onto quantitative MRI data, because I think that would be the best point. Um, it's that if we can apply this to pathological data sets later on um, and we're able to actually get accurate representations of the white matter tracks, we'd be able to see how they are affected by pathology, um, if, if there are any issues and so on, or by trauma. So I think that would be an interesting point to investigate as well. And so basically to conclude, um, we acquired and processed a spinal cord of five rats, um, which we applied an agglomerate clustering algorithm, as well as other algorithms uh, on the average of those five rats on the quantitative metric maps. And then we also tried to test a couple of validation methods um, but they still don't seem to be perfect as of right now. And so we're still looking to try and improve this work as well. And so with that, I'd like to thank the entire lab, uh, the current members, the past members, everyone who I've spoken with and brought my two years here. And thank you for your attention. So, uh, uh, so maybe uh, Sandra, uh, Thanks for the presentation. It was quite clear. I uh, really appreciate all the uh, illustrations and the diagram. I'll start off with the uh, maybe comments on the document on the thesis. Sure. <laughs> um, so I think it was properly structured, and the presentation was good overall. Um, I feel sometimes some sections were a bit 
I written in Rush, so I think some sections would need to be just revised. Okay. Like in conclusion, I think I saw XX and XX. So yeah. I think some things still needed to be completed, so um, yes. just make sure that everything is thoroughly reviewed. Uh, some also, some images are not sure, you need to check in the alert and get to review. Some uh, figures that come from uh, other sources, be sure that they're properly referenced, okay. or if you have uh, the authorization to use them in the thesis. So. Uh, particularly, particularly in the literature review, you just make sure, make sure you have um, all the right approvals. Sure. Um, also, in the literature review, I think um, it would be worth to just, I think you present so sort of the anatomy of this one chord and the uh, part and now uh, on microscopy imaging. Um, I think it's missing a bit on uh, different challenges that you have with visualizing the white matter tracks on microscopy. Uh, you touched on uh, it very quickly, but I think that's really the main focus of, of your project. So I think if you were to um, kind of expand that point a bit more okay. uh, to really uh, you know, explain what are the difficulties, what are the approaches that you presented to be able to see them better among the okay. rest of the images. And I would also suggest you to add a kind of an overview diagram, uh, especially in the set uh, methods section. You have those graphs basically ready from your presentation. and trying to read through the methodology, particularly the 3.3 and 3.4, it was uh, sometimes difficult to follow the text. I think it would help the reader to have that overview background of the different sections of the image processing steps. Um, so we would add that in the um, Another point I wanted to touch base on is the, um, the actual contribution. So uh, from all the parts you've had in your methodology, what are the parts really that's uh, you did, or, or which parts you had some help, or for example, the acquisitions, did you do that by, uh, on your own, or? So um, we did, so <laughs> what I helped with was the sample preparation and a bit of the acquisitions, but the acquisitions, so this is a, it's a follow-up project of someone else's project that I helped on as well um, for Rad Atlas, um, but most of the acquisitions was done by my colleague for the, for the actual uh, obtaining the images. And then, um, so what I helped with was uh, the tissue preparation, so I did some of the fixations, um, the staining, all that stuff, mm -hmm. as well as the uh, processing and pre-processing of the images. Um, so I helped out with uh, with a lot of the scripts and stuff because we did that all from MATLAB. Yeah. Um, so I worked on those as well. Okay. So I think it'd be important to clear that uh, you have some clarification sure. on, on It's important when you write a thesis to, be sh to make it clear what are your actual contributions. Uh, so it's fine. You could put out those sections in the thesis, that's okay. Uh, but you just have to uh, kind of clarify at the beginning what are your actual contributions, where you helped, and what is your core contribution. Okay. Sure. Um, in terms of more technical questions, so um, so you used five rats in your in your study. Um, so it's it's always quite a it's a lot. I know it's a lot of work and quite challenging to do all the. Um, the dissections and the acquisitions. Um, so do you think that's sufficient to cover the variability that you would see in the fiber tracks? Um, I know it's, in your, it's not necessarily the main point of your thesis, but do you think that five is sufficient? And maybe that could explain the differences you see in the uh, vaccine lab buses. Uh, or if you had unlimited resources, would you actually add more? And how would you change the protocol? Yeah, it's a good question. And this is a question that's come up a lot too. Um, uh, so I think obviously always having more data for the most part is always better. Um, so just be able to be certain that what you're seeing is actually correct. Um, but to me, five rats, it's, it's, not, it's not a small sum either. And there, I mean, what we see is we, we also have variability um, between the, the sexes. So male, two, two male, three female. Two male, three female. Um, so we, we kind of have like a spread of the, of, of, of the rats, but if we, if we had unlimited resources, like you said, and a lot more time, um, it would, it, it's always better to have more, uh, just to get more data, to, to be more sure. But if I, if I feel like five rats isn't, um, it's not a small number either. Um, and the, the thing is, it's, it's kind of, like if there were two, two could two two would be like very small, right? It's like okay, you only have two two sample size, but at five, um, we we kind of end up looking at like okay, there there's these different rats and the spinal cords theoretically 
it shouldn't vary too much because they're all within the same age range as well. Maybe one other thing that we could do is look at age, um, age related. So see if like the, the, the tracks change at varying ages or so on. What was the range of age? So it was uh, two to five months. Uh, so I, at that point, the rats are adult. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, so it's two to five months in, in range. So it, it changes significantly in, in age as well. So you would see different patterns or different architectures based on their age. Well, it would be, for example, useful to have different groups of, of, of these rats depending on them, their ages. Yeah, yeah, that could that could be something that we can investigate. The thing is, I don't I don't know how it, it's tough to say because um, there isn't a lot of literature that really dives into the site of architecture of this and looks at these types of things. So it's tough to say if like age on age base, do the tracks change a lot or do they not? So it could be something worth looking at to see if like, okay, at this age versus this age, is there a difference if they're really old, if they're really young? Um, I'd say maybe at a younger age, since it might be more developing, yes. Um, but I guess once you hit adult, does it change between like when you first hit adult to later on in, in life? Yeah. Um, another person, so I'm not from the field, so it's a bit enlightening. Uh, can you explain the, kind of the applications that would use the atlases you propose for white matter cover tracks. Uh, so you have a pipeline that is able to generate these maps. Um, can you explain, like, clinically how this could be used? Uh, what, what, like, rationale or what applications, like, nurses would actually use this for? Right. Um, so I would say that, so because we're basing this off of quantitative metrics, um, what I would say is that if we're looking at, let's say, pathology, so clinically speaking, um, any any types of multiple sclerosis, for example, um, if if we get maps of multiple sclerosis like this clustering, um, what how would that affect? So this is assuming, of course, that everything's robust and you know the. the the clustering outputs are on a healthy sample are clear and concise and like precise. Um, and then when we compare that to a uh, damage or pathological set, do we see the same thing? Do we get the same uh, kind of uh, tracks? Are the tracks smaller? Are they bigger? Um, do they shrink? Are there holes in the tracks? Is there like separate clusters that we're seeing, right? Um, so this would, I would think, help one pinpoint um, a lot of the uh, kind of the degeneration of, of the spinal cord of, of the myelin and axons, as well as then we'd be able to see that like, okay, if a lesion is here or like we see that there's a tract here of the lesion, um, how does this, we would then be able to predict like, okay, it's affecting this tract specifically, which would affect this function of the body. And then we'd be able to kind of, if we do this over multiple sets, we kind of be able to get the data of like, um, does it always affect kind of the same portion, the same side, the same tract? Does it vary? And obviously the diseases normally do vary, but we'd be able to have that data clear um, with, with the clustering outputs. So the, the map or the atlas would it enable to extract these quantitative metrics. So when you compare that to a specific subject, you could identify where you have some uh, abnormality. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Um, the other thing I want to touch base on is the, so the uh, actual validation scores that you present and kind of linked to, um, to ground truth. So when you look at your tables, I think this table, yeah, 4.1, 4.2, um, you see very, very little difference, right? As you increase the, the number of clusters. Right. And uh, I think you mentioned that briefly during your presentation, but how reliable these metrics are, are, uh, are they really? And, and would you actually recommend to use this in the future when, for example, you we do these experiments with more data or with different uh, animals, would you still use the same metrics? Yeah, it's a good question because I've, I've been asking myself that so as like well. Sometimes it's a 0 0.01 difference right. between different clusters. So right. it, the, it's not clear cut, right? Where exactly. you have the optimal number of clusters. Yeah, and yeah, that's a thing. So I would say they're, I wouldn't rely too heavily on them. Um, and, and this, um, I didn't present it. But you guys saw that the spectral clustering was really off in terms of the way it clustered and so on. But it had the best validation scores. Um, so yeah, I'm surprised so actually that was a question why you gave those poor results in terms of best. It, I, honestly, I, I don't know. I didn't have a chance to really 
go hard into investigating it um, to see why why I was giving that. And the k-means worked fine. I just applied it, and because it's it's really just an, all we have to do is uh, I use the same. Um, they're both from they were all from Scikit-Learn. So I just applied the algorithm, right? And I just inputted the data. So and you didn't really need to vary too much. I even with the selector clustering, I inputted the connectivity matrix as well because it takes it as an input, and so it should have theoretically been better than the k-means because you have the spatial uh, information already there. Um, so I'm not entirely sure why the results for special clustering were, were that strange. I have to investigate to see. But even with other clustering techniques, you saw very little difference, right? Yeah, for the scores, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So going back to the scores, yeah. So I would say that the scores right now, um, they're not too reliable. But the thing is, there aren't many other validation techniques um, at the moment to, to quanti quantitatively uh, validate clustering. And that's, that's one of the issues that I found is that like, I, I look through the, the literature to see what other people are using. And Silhouette Score is one of the most commonly used ones. Um, it's used in kind of almost every kind of validation, uh, any kind of clustering study. Um, and then when I was going through the literature, it's uh, there, there's like, it's either you use kind of um, manual labels to try and compare it. So you have like a gold standard and you compare it to that or you use these. And there, there was maybe, I think, four or five different techniques that you can use um, to get so that. So in the literature, when, you, when people would use the silhouette score, you would, in, like in their published works, did they see an actual difference in the, the silhouette? So here, you don't really see a lot of difference while increasing the number of clusters. Yeah. Um, you see a, a, a kind of a difference in the, how they, in their values, or? Is so it more clear cut with the, with the no, it, it it also it also depends on the data, right? Um, some of some of the data, um, like I said, there isn't much uh, clustering on spinal cord data, for example, um, but it wasn't as clear cut. But they were able to kind of uh, so these validation scores are also used to um, find the optimal number of clusters. So like for me, I was just using kind of a range of from five to twenty nine. Um, what a lot of these uh, studies do, they end up looking at, they use, the, they apply these, these scores and then they'll see, and then they will to kind of get one that's a bit more prominent. So let's say it'll be, it'll be up by maybe 0.5 or one, not, not 0.5, point, so usually like 0.05 roughly, um, maybe 0.1 uh, at the highest. And then they'll be like, okay, this is the largest that we see. So it's like, Okay, we will take this as our optimal cluster, but in the literature, I didn't. It, it wasn't like it was. The values were kind of similar in within this range, and I didn't see many values that got close to one. Usually, everything was between 0 0.5, 0 0.6. So you're in the proper range is just really these things that are. Yeah. And, and for so I understand you can't really get ground truth. Is there a way to at least have a gold standard so to be able to? You mentioned it a bit. Uh, you had someone that could manually delineate these these regions. I don't know if you have an example of uh, microscopy images where you would actually see um, these different clusters appearing in which you could have a manual delineation of those. Yeah. Is that feasible or not at all? They're really visually you can't see any difference between these, these groups. So I mean so that's what the Paxinos group did, right? right? So they did it visually and they manually delineated mm -hmm. all, all the clusters. And, um, but even then, they weren't able to visualize everything with all their staining techniques. So I'm, I'm not sure, I have to look more into kind of how Gray's Anatomy got their um, clustering structures and like throughout the literature. But it's, I think it is feasible, but it'd be really extensive work. And the thing is, there isn't any one specific group that has all of it in one specific location. So even that's why the Paxinos Atlas, what they did was, um, if you remember for the mouse, um, they basically, for, for, these, for these tracks here, they, they extrapolated from the literature. And they, they're, they're individual studies that kind of looked specifically at like one tract or not everything as a whole. And then they took that and then they added it onto their atlas saying like, okay, we extrapolated this. We found, we went to the literature, found uh, this study that looked at, let's say the vestibular spinal uh, tract here, the ventral spinal thalamic tract, um, and then they put it in. But there isn't anything right now that's uh, comprehensive enough to do that. I, 
it is possible, I'd say. I, I don't so think this is basically a pain from a compounding of all different studies done previously, and they kind of exactly. Of so it's it's their atlas, and then on top of that, um, they added they added information to that. So okay, yeah. I think that that'd be something to look into in the future too. We have something a bit more reliable that right. you could base yourself upon, where you could get these a bit more reliable quantitative metrics instead of assessing this additional. Right. Um, something that was missing in the in the thesis, and I understand it was this was based on previous uh, previous work, but it's on the segmentation tool. Okay. Uh, so I guess a lot of your pipeline is based or it depends on the output of the segmentation. Right. Um, you put a reference, but I think it'd be worth to add a bit more detail okay. in the segmentation sure. in the document. Can you explain to me a bit more how it works and um, you know, how what features it's using for well, for segmentation? Is it on a supervised approach? Is it based on machine learning? So this one isn't specifically. Um, we so this is there's two iterations of the segmentation tool that um, we had. Um, so there's a newer iteration, Axon DeepSeg, which actually. Um, is more a machine learning based approach um, and but the one that we used and for for this for our data here was um, because we had segmented the data before that tool was finished um, so we had already all the data before uh, before the machine learning based tool was done um, so that one is actually it, it's not it's not machine learning based um, but what it does is basically um, you can it's more a threshold based and basically it looks at the intensities and then you can play it's it, it requires more um, user input um, with that so you actually have to play around with the threshold levels and then once you have you kind of have an, have like a small sample where you, you play around with the threshold levels and then once um, you think it's adequate it'll apply it to everything that that's kind of the way this one works okay, so it's an um, tool yeah it's, it's yeah exactly there's a bit more of a UI exactly so with, with that one, um, as opposed to the machine learning based one, which is all automatic, and you just have to specify your inputs, what kind of data that you're, you're inputting. Um, so it's, it's just trained on that. So I think it uses SEM and TEM, I believe, but I'm not sure for the uh, machine learning one. Uh, SEM for sure, because um, we, we looked at that later on, and it's one of the main uh, image modalities that we use for, for scanning. Um, and so yeah, so you just put in the modality, put in your pixel size, and then it'll it'll compute the. Uh, yeah, so the tool you're currently using isn't looking into like morphology features of the axons. It's really just not as much exactly. exactly. And do you have an idea of how accurate it is, like a high score of the? Mm. I can't recall the numbers off the top of my head. Um, it was somewhere I think in the range of between 0.75 and 0.85, I think, roughly. But I'm not, no, I, don't quote me on that because I'm not 100% sure, but I think it was on roughly the same type there. of images you're using. Yes, exactly, project. exactly. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that, that's an important part of, of the pipeline, and uh, sure. so it should be important to add out to your thesis. And okay. do you, can you, so right now, the way I understand is the inputs are basically quantitative metrics to extract from the segmentation. Right. Yes, exactly. Um, is it feasible to think you could actually use directly the segmentation outputs and actually use intensity or texture features from the segmented axons to use that as an input for the clustering algorithms? Or really, it's better to, you know, based on like the, the ratio and things like that? And the, uh, yeah. I, th I, think, I think the quantity metric map is really what makes it um, more feasible for the clustering. I mean, because it's based off the variation of like let's say axon diameter and so on, it'll vary throughout the spinal throughout the spinal cord, and so it's really looking at that those variations and those differences to give give us the clustering outputs. So I think the quantum metric maps um, would be more feasible. I don't know if it'd be possible to do it without them, um, just based off of like intensity of of the. I don't think so. I, I actually don't think so because uh, because the yeah, segmentation it, it basically it would be the metric map it would be using would mostly be because um, it's segmenting the diameters of the axon and the myelin. So it it's essentially be only looking at one metric, for example, and be the the diameter essentially. Right. Yeah. So you're so, basing on some parametric uh, measures that you extract from the 
It's like the right, exactly. Kind of indirect. Yeah, exactly. And one last question I had for the, for the next round is, um, I think you discussed that in your limitations. So you talk about image resolution as a limitation um, of uh, basically clustering results. Uh, would you argue it's really a, an issue with image resolution or the magnification? It's more rely or it's more related to the segmentation tool, which isn't able to adapt for different. I, I'm, I don't know. It's just an open question. But is it more of a segmentation problem or it's more of an image resolution? I'd say both because both are linked. Um, essentially, um, if we have so at the current image resolution, um, we're we're not able to segment the smaller axons, right? So it's and that's 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 really an image resolution problem. And so if we were able to yeah, these small axons are really important. Some areas have a, a larger density of smaller uh, axons. So and we if we're looking at it visually, you'll see like there there are an abundance of them. And so. Um, I mean, you can manually correct for them too, which which we kind of did, but it, it doesn't um, it, it doesn't help as much when unless you're really getting these smaller axons properly segmented. Um, and so, yeah, it, I think I think it's it's they're, they're both tied together. If if the image resolution is a lot lower, um, the segmentation will be less accurate, which will then give worse results. Yeah, the same thing you need a segmentation tool that is able to uh, basically pick up on these smaller yeah. axons. Yeah. So I mean, yeah, you can maybe like. I, I don't know if there's like a tool that's much better out there that could you know really pick up on these small um, axons with the image resolution that we have, um, but for now, yeah, this is this is what I've seen so far. Right. Thanks. Uh, right, do you continue with the next Okay. Thank you, um, Pablo. It was, uh, it was great to 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 have you in the lab. Uh, it's really amazing work. Um, it's, um, as was mentioned, it's really a uh, collaborative work. So you did work with Fabian, Scott Saliani, with, uh, yeah. with uh, Christian Perron, um, and, uh, and, and others in the lab. Uh, so yeah, congratulations on, on this. Uh, I think it's, it's very important work. Um, as, as was discussed, there's also a lot of you know, other things to explore. Yeah. Um, and in fact, I will, I'll basically uh, follow up on Samuel's uh, Point about you know why not including the, the segmentation, but you know even before why not including the images themselves? Because in fact, um, if we do some uh, feature analysis on the images, I'm sure we could get a lot of information, uh, like you know spectral information um, that that basically you know that if, if you have like a different density um, of axons, then that, that would you know surely be reflected by this other spectral information. Right. So, and we have never looked into this. No, yeah. So We've always been basing off the quantitative yeah. metric maps. That's true. So, on the, you know, on the co conclusion openings, that's definitely uh, yeah. something to look at. Uh, sure. Maybe, uh, maybe to another life. Uh, <laughs> um, so, like a couple of small, small points. Um, axon seg is uh, so the, the key uh, algorithm is, is based on discriminant analysis. Okay. Uh, and it does, in fact, look at morphological features because the discriminant analysis uses uh, priors such as axon diameter range and things like that. Okay. Um, you, so one thing you did not mention, but it's, it's amazing news, is that uh, like the, the, uh, the project, like the, the follow-up that you're doing is based on a project that has recently been accepted for you know, minor, uh, like with minor um, revision in your image yeah. uh, a week ago, so I think it should be mentioned. Um, yeah, um, so hey, you kind of, you know, uh, alluded to that, but uh, your, your, it's a huge hypothesis that, in fact, you're doing this clustering, assuming that those tracks can nicely be separated, right? And um, it's likely not the reality, if, even though I don't think anybody on the planet knows the answer. But you know, looking at you know, cats, it's kind of called the uh, histology, and and uh, Stephanie Ste Ste can, can tell more about that because she looked into a lot of uh, different uh, literature on that. The, the tract the cross studies are kind of all over the place and overlap, and so on. Yeah. So maybe we are trying to. 
you know, use a method that might not be appropriate. And that brings me to another like a, a related question is, which is, um, are there other clustering approaches that would be more probabilistic that might be uh, you know, more, more adaptive to this problem? Yeah. No, it's a good question. I mean, we see here as well, there's an overlap, right, um, between some of the tracks. Um, so I agree that clustering wouldn't be able to give us that at all um, because it clearly separates the um, cl clearly separates the boundaries of, of, of the different clusters that, that we're getting. As for other techniques, um, apart from clustering, like like probabilistic clustering, right? Because here it's more like a, a binary. You know, yeah, based off of the like each pixel is stable with one uh, cluster, but exactly. you have probabilistic. Yeah, so trying to think because yeah. trying to think how probabilistic clustering approach would work um, with regards to our data. Um, Yeah, I'm, I'm not. I'm not too sure. Uh, I'm not sure how how we would be able to apply it. Um, yeah, because I, I haven't I haven't looked into it that much. But that's kind of the reason. So I don't have much background knowledge on probabilistic clustering. Um, Maybe that's something. That yeah, it, it could be something to look yeah, into for sure. Yeah. yeah. Approach. Um, another aspect that could also be like um, that could also help with this. Uh, your end goal is to basically provide uh, to the world a supposedly like more accurate and exhaustive version of, of an atlas of uh, anatomy. Um, so you're you're basically using the Pythagoras atlas to say, well, look, you know. Seems that my my tracks make sense, but why not using the Pythagoras atlas along with your uh, with your approach? You know, like physically having uh, like a constraint, like having priors, like spe special priors right. on your on your approach, uh, yeah. and basically work together with Pythagoras. Yeah. So it's possible, but one of one of the issues again that we see here is that the tracks aren't there, right? So we're missing we're missing information from from these. From 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 the rat, for, at least from the rat pecting and stuff, right? Ah, uh, okay, okay. So so yeah, yeah, so from, yeah, yeah, so, yeah. From, right. so from this one, right. and we we use this for our rat atlas project as well. But they they even they say themselves in their study that we know we're missing right. information. We weren't able to visualize all the tracks that you know prior literature. Based on some data that they identified, maybe could use. Yeah, exactly. So for some of some of the other tracks that we see here, um, especially. Mostly in the um, posterior section, it's, it's more well defined. Um, but when we're looking ventrally, they, they don't see us well. Yeah. They, they track us. Yeah. Uh, so one thing you mentioned is that you done some polls. So uh, during the method, you said so yeah. the uh, metrics were so actually the, the segmentation was done some polls for computational time. It's not really for computational time, right? Well, why did you done some polls the uh, segmentation? Well, I mean, more generating the metrics. But I mean, one of, one of the reasons would be computational time, right? Because I mean, if because our images are heavy, they're they're really large. But I mean, you wait like the computational day. The one, you know, like is two years. But one key aspect is that, like, how do you generate your axon volume fraction and bias volume fraction? Um, well, it's, it's just volume fraction. Yeah, it's a volume fraction. Exactly. So, so it's it's just based off. Yeah. So I mean, yeah. Okay. I see. Yeah, I see. Yeah, I see. Yeah. You need to, you know, have that uh, specific uh, space to specify an area. Yeah, exactly. And get your metrics. To get your metrics. Yeah. Um, maybe just one last uh, technical point. Um, so. The so again during the metrics generation, you, you took the average, like of uh, for example, it's nine meter. Uh, why taking the average? Uh, like how how is the distribution 
motivation ou pas, c'est une question de choix. This is for the template generation or for, for the, the uh, for generating the uh, matrix maps like for generating your 50 maps. by 50, 50 micron by 50 micron below. Yeah. The average. Yeah. Why the average? I mean, it's a distribution, it's not like yeah, it's, it's, it's the number. So yeah. You look into how, how those uh, matrix uh, would change if, yeah. uh, if we didn't do just a normal uh, averaging. No, I don't think we did, honestly. Um, I think we had just averaged it. Um, uh, unless Aldo may have looked at it, because Aldo was the one who uh, worked on that script specifically. So I don't know if, it, but I don't think so. I'm not sure. Yeah. I mean, all, all those questions are potentially like a really good work question. Right. Really right. It's good to you know, anticipate. Okay. Yeah. Right. Sure. All right. <laughs> so, thanks. Thank you, Harris. Uh, I'm glad to see that this has evolved into a pretty elaborate project, and I think you found your footing. And uh, I think I think this is very important work. Uh, staring at this slide in particular, I'd like to just check whether you you know how you interpret that this is important work. For example, we see that the mouse atlas is much better characterized, and you know the rat still misses some rats. Why? Why rats? I mean, is this because there's less interest in rats? Why Why do you want to get a rat atlas when you have something that's so well prepared for us? Right. So, I mean, so I can actually loop this back to the Cooper Zone project, um, where we tried using mouse, right, initially, mice for, for that study. Um, but we ended up finding was that when we're trying to do quantitative imaging for, for, the, mi for the mice, it's too small. The re we don't get proper resolution. We don't, we don't see things, right? And so with rats, we were able to actually visualize it better. And here, you know, first it's a striking difference in the shape, but can you also comment about the size differences between the between the tracks? Tracks. Yeah. So that's so this could be one of these sides. So one of one of the things, and I think this is probably my fault. It's um these aren't so this the the one so the example that they provided. Because they only provide one example um, that has all the uh, for for cervical level rather. Um, so this is C8 versus um, for this one, this is C1. Um, this is C1 as well. So I think that's my fault. Um, I didn't choose the right images. Um, so it, it, there would be differences um, in the tracts um, as you go down, because well, depending on what what level you're at, the the spinal cord, it's, it, it gets smaller in certain areas. The gray matter is bigger or smaller, it expands as you go on. So that may be one of the reasons. So you even see that, like one of the characteristic traits to tell um, the different levels apart is just looking at the gray matter, because it's really distinctive um, between the levels. And you'll see it's, it's not the same at all. So, so this is actually to scale. And it says that that one millimeter you show there, it also applies to the mouse. You're saying because it's that, C1 to C8, the cord gets smaller, so actually yeah. this is the right relative proportion at those levels? That's also a good question. I don't think so. Um, they didn't give a scale for this image. So I don't know if it's from the same group, so it's possible that it is. Um, but they didn't give a scale. So. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm going here by intuition. I, I was hoping right. you could give us maybe some complete numbers. But yeah. it's true, the mouse, spinal cord, the mouse spinal cord, we had trouble with resolution. So we moved to rat because we could actually get a couple of clean box cells inside exactly. uh, the corpus and, and the and the white matter of the spinal cord. What is the difference in size between the spinal cords? Like, can you give me a, just a question? Oh, that's a good question. Um, Order of magnitude. So yeah, ma microscopically, it's it's not it's not huge. It's it's not a huge difference. Um, I would say like Matt. Uh, I'm trying to. Say, I've never seen a mouse spinal cord actually. Uh, so I'm trying to think. But um, I'd say so. So the rat is approximately um, two to three millimeters in diameter. Um, so this, the the mouse, I think, I would say it's probably one millimeter. In, for, from that's, my, that's 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 about right. Yeah, and that's kind of the limit because we're going for resolution where you know we could get a couple of clean muscles. Right. And two to three millimeters would give us that one. Yeah. This is kind of it's too small. Too small. Yeah. Uh, good. Uh, now. You know, the distinction from the mouse to the rat, that we discussed. Why rat as it relates to humans? Is there anything that, you know, makes it a good model 
do you know of a particular application where RAT is good? And you know, what other models would it be possible to consider? So RAT in comparison to human, um, it's actually, I would say not. And the main reason is actually because um, in the human, the cortical spinal tract is actually on the anterior side, whereas in the rat, it's on the posterior side. So already there's one difference there. The rest of the tracks remain the same for the most part, um, but that's one of the major differences. And this is one of the more uh, feature-based uh, tracks. So there's a lot going on in that track specifically. Um, but I think if we are able to kind of apply it on one, uh, apply it on one species and get something proper, then it could be applied to other species. Because the pipeline, you know, then it should theoretically work um, based off of that. Fair enough. And you, you mentioned the cortical spinal tract. So can you go to slide 14, sure. where you show this very high density exactly there, right? The axon density, is that the cortical spinal tract yes. right there? Yes. And that's a very distinctive feature that I don't see anywhere else. It seems like on axon diameter, on axon volume fraction, on G ratio, on myelin thickness, and on myelin volume fraction, everything's uniform, and yeah. yet this density really stands out. Yeah. So it's, I mean, can, can you give me an intuitive explanation of what might be happening? And then maybe also just, you know, maybe a, a speculation on other things that might contribute to this right. very prominent feature. Yeah, so it is interesting because if we actually look at the axon volume fraction, you'll see that it's slightly more, I don't know if you can see it. Um, yeah, so maybe but the window it, it's, is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it, it, it is slightly more prominent in T6, but you don't see it in any of the other ones in, in C3, uh, L1, it's, it's not as clear. So it is interesting. Um, and this so, is- you know, Looking at the axon density, you're really going from like you know, 100 to 300. You know, like it's yeah. just like a tripling. Yeah, it's a large density. variation. Yeah. But nothing else seems to indicate that. So physically, could it be that there's so much space and all of a sudden you're just shrinking everything? But that would also manifest itself in the axon volume fraction. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, it would show up in the axon volume fraction as well. Um, and even the myelin volume fraction, potentially. Um, it's a good question because from what we've observed, and so the cortical spinal tract, it has a higher axon density. Um, but when you're looking at it visually, um, it actually has a smaller, um, it's, the axon diameter is smaller. But I think one of the issues is that the range for, it's, it's not a huge difference in the ranges for the axon diameter either. So it might not be as common. Um, as well, yeah, I'm trying, I'm trying to think what else could, so we kind of see it here in the myelin thickness, um, larger myelin thickness. Um, in that area, in the same, in the same exact area. Um, but yeah, you're right. So let's let's you know go up on a limb here. Sure. You know, speculate. Maybe maybe some of these issues that you mentioned. I mean, I have one possible explanation. I'm just curious. You know, I know I'm putting you on the spot to think. Yeah, no, quickly, but uh, you mentioned a couple of problems that the, the technique has, both in terms of segmentation and in terms of staining. Right. Is there any of those that maybe could explain this? What are the issues that you mentioned? Yeah, so, well, for, for fixation specifically, or for staining in, in general, um, so what we end up getting, it could be, so these are perfusion fix, so theoretically they should be more homogeneous in terms of fixation. Um, so we shouldn't see too many variations. But what, what ends up happening is that some of the, um, what we get are like vacuoles in, in the axons and myelin, so they, they tend to be bigger or larger um, in size. Um, which is which is due to the preparation methods. Um, specifically, I think it's a fix fixation that that contributes to that, um, as well as for staining. It would be the osmium penetration, um, which could stain over stain or like stain really deep and damage samples because it's a heavy metal. Um, so that so it could just be kind of like a pile up of osmium right there. Yeah. The reason. Maybe it just likes the center of the specimen. It's, it's possible, yeah. What about the small, is it possible to interpret this in terms of we know we're not getting small axons. So somehow is the corticospinal tract characterized by particularly small axons small that, axons. you know, pop up on your segmentations, but you really cannot identify them. So you know, it just so appears as something. Diameter. 
Yeah, it's kind of, you know, with a lot of osmium there, but you can't really tease it out. So you end up with uh, something that's bright on this density, but yet you cannot see it in the diameter. See it in the diameter. Right. Yeah, that's also possible. And like I was saying that visually we do see that there's um, a lot more smaller axons um, around there. And usually- Are we aware of, so where are the small ones? Like, do you know what parts of the spinal cord yeah. will have particularly small axons? So, yeah, so essentially the way the way the way um, it works is actually, and I was just looking at this again today, is that um, around the periphery, you'll have a lot um, larger axons. Um, and then as you go to closer towards the center, so this applies to both um, on the uh, anterior side and the posterior side, but it's more it's more prominent in the uh, anterior side. You see it very clearly, where you have a lot of larger axons, and then once you get so that's why it's like, well, we'll look at the diameter. Um, it's a lot more bright, and then it's it goes smaller to, as you go closer towards the gray matter. But nothing about the cortical spinal tract that says, oh, you know, these are particularly large or particularly small. I'm just looking for something that would differentiate that. Would, that yeah, from those. Sort of the cord. Okay. Not that I can recall. Them. So, uh, yeah, I, I think it's a drastic change. So something just to think about, sure. you know, it's, it's a factor of three from what I see from the color scale. Yeah. Uh, but uh, still, that's important. Well, thank you for uh, your presentation, your thesis. It was, uh, it was well written, it was to read it. It's a, uh, so I'm, Clearly from outside the field, right? I do I do imaging on a regular basis, but I don't do segmentation. I don't work with the spinal cord, and and yet the, the text was uh, easily readable. Uh, it, it some parts are pretty dry by definition, so it's a question. Um, yeah, and then uh, yeah, so I learned a bunch of things uh, while reading. It, so that, that's also a, a good thing. And uh, yeah, and the purpose of this then is to challenge you a little bit, so we keep. Uh, Going. Yeah, you're lucky. Uh, people. Uh, uh, all right. So, uh, could you go to slide uh, 19? So the one we were looking at before. Uh, and what I'm going to do here is, is uh, yeah. So maybe talk a bit about how to bring in someone from outside. Because so, can you please describe these figures? To <laughs> what am I seeing here? Like, what's blue? What are these letters? What are these regions? Yeah. What are you trying to find? What they found? And what is the missing stuff? Sure. Yeah, that's a good question. I probably should have been a bit more explicit, so I do apologize. Um, so essentially, um, these these numbering. So, so first, let's look at the mass specs, you know, because it's the most uh, detailed. But essentially, what what these are are the different white matter tracts, right? And so the, the the label these are just the labels for so VST ventral spinal thalamic. So it's just the names of the tracts. Okay. Um, one of the things that they also look at is in the gray matter. We didn't particularly study the gray matter, so that's why for us um, in our clustering we just completely ignored it because we didn't look at any of the metrics because the axons in the gray matter are. Uh, unmyelinated for the most part, and we're focusing on the myelinated axons in the white matter. So, so where's the gray matter? So, okay, so this is the gray matter. So, um, so it's, it's the central butterfly, essentially. So all of so all of this here, this is all the gray matter. And everything that's um, outside of this boundary, this border, uh -huh. is the white matter. Okay. And so it, it, in, in, in our clustering, it's pretty clear because the gray matter is just this entire blue block. So, and then everything outside of that is the white matter. Okay, and so on the Paxinos, the white matter is white and blue. They're both white matter. So uh, the the white for example, is blue, right? So, so yeah, so I think um, in the Paxinos, the blue is just highlighting the, the tracts because not the entire spinal cord. Um, there aren't tracts everywhere, everywhere. Um, and so this is something debated because in the human, there's a lot more tracts. Um, and so a lot of it is more um, filled with tracks, but like there's a lot of this empty space here. Um, well, in the rat pexinus we can ignore, um, but there's a lot more empty space. And so not everything is completely um, filled with uh, a tract for the most part. Um, and basically the way this is divided is that they'll show, they're trying to make it a bit more clear by showing um, all the tracks, but not clumping them together on the entire image. So this, so it's symmetrical. 
but that's probably the first thing I should say, is that if there's a tract here, this blue tract, it'll still be here on this side. Um, but the Paxinus Atlas isn't showing it just for the sake of clarity. Um, because they're, they're showing that, okay, if it's on one side, we already assume that it's on the other side. And it's just for the sake of clarity that um, we're showing it on one side. So not everything's clumped together. Like they don't show everything. Okay, that's for the tract. But I try yeah. to look at the gray matter, it's not symmetrical. So that's what that was the question I had. Yeah, exactly. So for the, for the gray matter, um, the, so I, I only like looked at the gray matter a bit. Um, when, when I was writing my thesis, talk about the tracks a bit. Um, but it is divided into like a lot more tracks of, of variation of, of tracks. Um, but it, you'll see, yeah, so you'll see that it, it, sh it should also be, um, it should also be symmetric from my understanding or mostly symmetric. Um, you'll see like some differences in, in circles, but it's essentially divided in the same way on both sides. Yeah, it's, 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 for, for, I mean, for the most part, but like there. you see the same tracks like TR9 here, TR9 here, here it's it's the same divisions, right? Um, here this the, the IMM is just not found on this side, um, but for the most part, like it's mostly mostly divided okay. symmetrically. Okay. And then my following question is, why can't you put the red axinos on top of your image and just check if you like get the gray matter right? Right? There's a big clump of gray matter. You, you could be quantitative with solid data and tell me I get the gray matter with like 100% precision. Right. Uh, so why can't you do that? So we could. Um, the reason, but I mean, for us, the gray matter is less important at this point, right? We, we, don't, we don't really care as much for the gray matter. Well, to, to segment the white matter, you need to find the you need to have the, You right? need to have mass of the both. That, that's right. Um, so you're right in that. And so we, we kind of did that for our rat atlas study um, for the prior study um, where we overlaid the Paxinos atlas onto our actual atlas. The reason I didn't want to do it here was because just because of the, well, I guess for the gray matter, it, it would make sense to do it for the gray matter at least just to have the same kind of uh, resolution with the gray matter or for the same space. Um, but the reasoning, my reasoning was that since we're missing so many uh, tracks in the red paxinos, it, it, it doesn't make sense to kind of overlay it on that point um, because we're, we're investigating what tracks are missing and what's not there, right? Yeah, yeah but you should at least be able to find what's in the red paxinos and then some, right? That's the idea. How, is, how do you do the registration? You mean with the masks? Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, understand, I understand that point, right? It's like we're using, we're using the white matter mask and the gray matter mask to, to register the quantitative data, like the, the mask onto our, or to, we overlaid the tracks onto, onto yeah, our mask. Yeah, does not know that, ah, okay. that, that question. Okay. So, so maybe you can explain that. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, so, so these masks, so our, our registration, how we do it, is based off of um, the white matter mask already, right? So what we're doing is we're, we have, um, I guess I can, I can actually go back to the methods and show you the mask. Uh, it might be easier to see it. Sorry, a lot of transitions. Yeah, so here. Okay, okay, okay. So you already create. So we already create uh, the white the white matter mass and the gray matter mass separation. So we have the the gray matter already um, right. averaged across. But then within the white matter mass in the in the vaccinos, you have some information that you could at least show that your clustering algorithm is able to find. It's similar to those ones, right? Yeah. It's similar to what we see at least in the vaccinos. Yeah. So yeah, we we could do that, and I we pretty much have the pipeline set up, so it actually wouldn't be too difficult, and then we'd be able to kind of overlay it. So because, it, because I'd say like one of the the big question I have when I read your thesis and saw your presentation is how are you going to validate this, right? You, you want you want to create the reference, yeah, and so you need to be super accurate, exactly. and so you need to go get every little bit of information that you right. have that's quantitative that you can, yeah. Uh, 
Because for now, you only have photo validation and, and, and inspection. Yes, right? exactly. So, so this, this could be. A, um, I just want to know like why this wasn't done. If it's if it's just because it's a large amount of work and it's outside of the scope, that's fine. But it's just, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. No, I, I think I think you bring up a valid point. Honestly, um, it, it could be done, and we have we kind of have a pipeline. We have it some. We implemented something similar onto our actual RAT atlas to to give us the um to to give us the tracks um from based off the Pexinos because that's what we're using as a reference. Um, but it could be done to at least kind of validate what's already there. Um, I think one of the tougher things though would be to so we can validate what's already there, but then on top of that, to validate the stuff that's not there, that's that's also a bit more challenging at this point because there isn't much references for those. But that is a good, that's a valid point. Yeah, and so just to go back to the visual inspection, yeah. so you, you have these quantitative maps where you see a lot, a lot of different types of parameters. So can you find the white matter tracks from these information just by eye, right? Are you able to take your four or five parameters and tell me this is, I'm sure 100%, this is a white matter track because there's this feature, this feature, this feature. And then you would be able to manually select one, in one slice and it doesn't take long, and then check if your clustering algorithm also finds it. Yeah. I think so. Um, but this requires um, extensive anatomical knowledge because what this would be is that you would have to look at, okay, we're looking at, let's say, axon diameter or whatever, whichever feature, right? You look at an area and you say, okay, we have this range of diameters, for example. What does that correlate to, uh, functionally speaking, um, in this area? Um, if, if, if we see that, like, it's for motor function or for, uh, for pain transition, something, or something that requires faster, um, like, uh, information transmission time, right? It, we need something, we need the information to be transmitted faster. You have a larger myelin sheath because it'll allow for faster conduction times. Um, then you look at that point and you're like, okay, so we have this area which corresponds to the functional um, uh, role of, of this specific area. So it's like, okay, we have this feature now. So we can look at all the, the range. We, we, you can kind of start delineating, looking around and be like, okay, where does that, Diameter range stop, and and you also have to be able to know at what's the range because even within a specific area, all the axons aren't going to be the same diameter. There's going to be variations, right? So you have to. It's not. It's not like you're going to have a, a clump of axons where they're all like five microns or whatever, like all within a specific area. They they'll vary, and so you would have to have kind of that knowledge. You'd have to be able to look, sit down, and be like, okay, we have to establish this is the range, and after this range. The next tract is this, and these are the axon diameters within that range, and then so on and so forth. So I'd say it's possible, but you need to have that extensive anatomical knowledge to be able to correlate what you're seeing with the function so that you know that it's for this specific tract. And then to be able to do that, you also need to kind of have references. And I think one of the one of the things right now is that it's not clear cut, right? On 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 these things. It's just it's not like, okay, we have all of this these axons within this tract are characterized like this, and that's it. There's like no variation, there's nothing. So I think it, I think it is possible, um, but it would require a lot of extensive knowledge and work. Um, and I don't have that knowledge, that's, that's one of the issues, is that I don't have that anatomy background. Um, so it's not easy to do, but it is feasible, I'd say. And so if you wanted to do it for a morning, how would you proceed? Yeah, so, so like I was just explaining, right, you'd have to, First, you have to try and correlate um, every single metric feature yeah, to I each mean, other. Like, uh, so, so you say you don't have the knowledge. So can you acquire uh, this? Okay. Can you, who would you ask? Yeah. Uh, right? Is, is there someone you know, that would be able to do this on the spot? Or you know, is it knowledge that, you need to, that's, that nobody has, so that yeah. someone needs to build? So yeah, I would say, I'd say it probably have to be like a collaborative. I don't think there's one person that could sit down and do this alone. Um, they would need to have the inputs of other people as well. For just, for um, just one track, right? For, for just one track, exactly. Just one track. But even, even for one track, yeah. Okay. Because there are studies that have been done on like, let's say specific, so this is where they got, so for, for the mouse vaccinos, this is where they got their, their tracks, right? It's from other studies. And these studies focused only on one track, right? Okay. So there are, there are groups that could like, spe that specialize in like looking at this one specific track and they'll follow it 
throughout the spinal cord and it varies as well a bit in size and stuff throughout the spinal cord and so on. So there's all these like different factors that you got to take into account. Um, but there are groups that study like one specific tract because it's, it's related to this specific function and role that they're, they're looking at. So you would need to kind of look at like different people to look at it, um, come to consensus. Um, it, it, it would require like quite a few people that are knowledgeable within, like I'd say like neuroscientists and anatomists that study the spinal cord would be most suited for that, um, to work on that. And, but they'd also have to be able to decipher like all the maps and metric maps. And okay, okay. So, <laughs> good, I, I get, so I think what was missing for me is like where uh, there are some things that uh, are extremely difficult to do that I, I wasn't aware of okay. extremely difficult to right. do. And so it's, I have one last question in the same vein is, sure. so I look at your microstructure clustering. Here, yes. And then I understand you want to get something similar to the mass PCS. Yes. I look at your resolution there. It's impossible. Yeah. Right? So you start with images that are incredibly well resolved. Why do you choose this pixel size? Is it, is it like, is it a fundamental limit? And if so, is, is, will you ever be able to find the, the little, uh, those, the little, for example, the disk structure, uh, and, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that would be like two or three pixels in your image. Right. Uh, and so, so fundamentally here, what's the, what's the solution? It's a good question. So it's interesting because so one okay. So if we if we actually look at um, what are we here? One of uh, let's talk to this. Um, one of one of the things that I liked about the K-means clustering, um, and even the spectral, is that they're a lot better with these smaller pixels. Um, they they if we could kind of um, clean those up, it would be better. That's that's one of the the I guess the drawbacks that I had with the glomerular clustering is that it's it's more blocky and it's it's. Um, with the smaller pixels, uh, smaller tracks, it's hard. It's harder to to visualize and represent. Um, whereas with Keen's clustering, it's just inherent to the al actual algorithm, where um, it it really divides the clusters up on on smaller bases. There's also a lot of noise at that point, so you have to have really clean data to be able to try and do that and apply it. But you'll see that there there are a lot smaller structures there, right? So it could be trying to maybe. I feel like. With a glomerular clustering, there might be. It's been tough because I've been trying to play around with the parameters to kind of try and mimic that, like to try and obtain smaller, um, to try and get those smaller tracks and smaller resolution and so on, like smaller pixel sizes. Um, I haven't been able to. So I would have to look into it more to see if that's actually just an inherent problem with the glomerular clustering, or can it be done with the actual algorithm? And if not, then you know, if we can maybe fine tune some of the other algorithms or even like a combined approach, you know, using not just one algorithm, but using the, f the good features of both algorithms to try and apply. So I go, I go even further, I mean, here, so, so why, why this pixel size? Can you, can you make it half the size? So that's, it's not, um, it's not one of the, it's not one of the uh, parameters that you can play around with. I mean, um, you start with images that are. You know, but I mean, within within the within the algorithm itself, I mean. But then. This question has nothing to do with the algorithm. Before you write the algorhythm. Okay, you, uh, you I see what the image. Yeah. 15, you would have chosen a 25. 25 or 25, 25, right. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's, it's a good question on why that was chosen. Um, so for, from from the uh, the reasoning, the reason that I was told was that it's just it, it was that was kind of the compromise that they found between having um, a good resolution with um, faster with with like decent amount of processing time. That was that was kind of that's what, what the, that's what they said in terms of uh, in terms of choosing that. So I'm talking about my colleagues that uh, that had applied this um, as as I got here, um, but. It could be, but as Julian had mentioned earlier, that's just a factor of time. So it could be possible to. So how long does it take to do one slice? To segment or to the whole pipeline, but once, but only only one uh, slice. Right? 
the full pipeline. Okay, so if we're excluding preparation, because preparation. Oh, is, outside the acquisition. Once oh, outside the image, acquisition. Once you have the image, image okay. you know, what's the processing time for those steps? Oh, once you have the image. So the segmentation takes for one slice. I'd say overall it would take for one one slice maybe like I think it, it's it's roughly I'd say half a day maybe. So I think the segmentation is the longest part of a, of of this. Um, I don't remember the exact time. The rest isn't as long, um, especially once you once you get well the pipeline, <laughs> well the template generation as well um, takes a few hours. Yeah, so I'd say half a day is like a, a reasonable estimate. Um, the, the, the shortest time, the clustering doesn't take as long. Clustering is probably one of the, the algorithm doesn't run too quickly, uh, it doesn't run too slowly, so it's, it's, it's inherently quick. Um, but it's all the, the processing of the images that, that takes the longest part. So about half a day for, yeah. for one slice. Yeah. So this is another, I think, important thing that, that needs to appear when you, you write your, your thesis is these are gigantic, gigantic. Right. And, and, you know, you see Elliot. Oh, yeah. And so, yeah, so, so this is also an important thing to mention. You're dealing with, um, you know, you cannot redo your calculations over and over again to see how it evolves super quick. Right. right? You need to. You need time to do that. You need time right. to do it. And that's, okay. That's part of it. Sure. Okay. All right, so let me just check. I think that that was mainly so this really helped me understand. So maybe you can add a few sentences, yeah, like, you know, sure. one or two sentences here and there to, to, to help with that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, also the, the use of the word optimal. You be careful in engineering school, right? Optimal. Yeah, you optimization. Have, yeah, you need to have an optimum, right? Yeah. You, 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 chose, if you chose a number of cluster that from your metrics is clearly not optimal. Yeah. Right. So uh, yeah, just be careful with that word. Okay. And um, yeah, so there were, I have a lot of questions that were already asked uh, elsewhere. And oh yeah, it's a thing. And please reread carefully your thesis, right? There and, and titles. You have to, like to do notes and stuff like that. So yeah, it's just, okay. just be yeah. careful. With that and and uh, the references is very important. Uh, your figures without references. Same thing on your presentation. Uh, you need to say where it, where the source is everywhere. Uh, okay. this, 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 uh, they'll look into it, I think, when, when, you, uh, when you want to do some interview. Yes. Yeah. All right, well, otherwise, thank you. Yeah, do you have other questions? Do you want to do another round? Or? Yeah, just a couple of quick questions. So all the way around this slide, <clears throat> so you mentioned it's not symmetrical, right? The addresses? Like no, they, the right they are symmetrical. They are symmetrical? Yeah. Left and right should, should be symmetrical. Okay. But you see some differences here, right? Like in the red, around the maximum side box. Over here? Yeah. In the white matter? Mm -hmm. There's yeah. some light. I mean, you're showing the, the only a half of the spinal cord, right? Yeah. I was just wondering why you only have to show half and not the entire. So we, so yeah, so we also, um, so based off of at least what we saw in the literature and what we've seen is that it essentially, other groups have said that it's symmetrical. So what we did, we actually symmetrized our, our images, left-right symmetry. Mm -hmm. um, so, so they're symmetrized on both sides. And so that's why we only showed, that's why I only showed half because of that, because we just symmetrized but it. But you run the algorithm on the entire slide, right? So I have, and then I, I've done it, I've done it on both. I've done it on full and I've done it on mm -hmm. half as well. So differences? there are, and um, the reason, so I would say the reason behind that is, um, it, it's a bit tough to say. So what what I would say is um actually I don't I don't have images here of that because I changed them. Um, it would be because of well. I mean, is it a computational error or it's actually maybe showing something that might be of interest in terms of I don't know tracks that are yeah that are not visible that that are yeah. It's a good question. It's a good question that I, I don't know. I honestly, I don't know if it, I don't think it's computational error because each time you run the, the algorithm, it, it gives us, it, gives, it comes back like kind of the same. I mean, I'd be interested so, to see, you know, the other half. The other half yeah. It's showing something that is not necessarily identical. Yeah. Maybe you're making an assumption that's maybe, I mean, I understand based on some and let's just say this, but it might be worth to actually explore, to explore the both. Yeah, full image. Yeah. 
Um, and last, maybe an open question is, um, so I guess you do this ex vivo study on rats as a proof of concept, right? So, so you know, you have access to high resolution imaging. What's the next step? Is it in vivo on MRI? Is that ultimately the, the goal is to be able to have this tool available to compute the white uh, matter tracks on, on diffusion weighted imaging? And if so, you know, if you had to supervise a student to actually go through all these steps, would you think similar in terms of your pipeline? What would change? Uh, what would need to be adapted? Yeah. So, yeah, I would say that that's actually, the, I'd say one of the next steps would be to try and apply it on other histological images, but that's also one of the, um, one of the things that I, that I mentioned in, in future work is applying it on like uh, MRI images, quantitative MRI images. Um, because I think that would be the most, uh, in terms of clinical, if you want to try and apply this clinically, it's, it's most of the studies are on in vivo with MRI. So it'd be the next logical step to, to go with, to try and apply it on that. Um, and so if we were to do this uh, on MRI images, uh, essentially you could, you could almost take, you can, you start off with the same images, you have the maps because uh, if you're doing quantitative MRI imaging, you, you'd be able to extrapolate your, your maps. Um, so your myelin volume fraction or um, any, any type of those maps, would it be the same? You would get this, you'd be able to see kind of the same, you should be able to see the same distribution in terms of the maps that we're getting histologically as well. Um, so you could essentially apply the pipeline um, almost as is. So basically um, change the input. Right. So yeah, you change the inputs exactly to the maps that you're extrapolating from the whichever MRI method they're using. Um, I because think, of the important difference in terms of image resolution, you think the clustering algorithm uh, would be affected by it, or uh, need to have maybe, as Shida was saying, maybe more probabilistic approaches to be able to cope with that right. and resolution. Yeah. It's it's a possibility, but I'm I'm just trying to think like um, if when when looking at the literature review of uh, one of the studies that, that did that that did k-means on yeah so Benjamin and Asaf as well, um, Asaf's particularly looked pretty nice in terms of uh, his uh, we can we can go back to it it's just it's easier it's easier to see um, like that one it's not that bad right like I'd say like it, it's it, in terms of what we're seeing uh, with our images with this, it's not, it's not, so this, I mean, here, this is on histology. Compared to that, mm -hmm. it's, it, it, looks, it looks cleaner, at least, and it looks nicer. Um, this looks more detailed with a lot more stuff, but it also is taking in a lot more noise. Um, whereas with the MRI, it's, it's taking a lot less noise. You still see the groups appearing. And exactly. So, so it's a good question. I don't know how it affects, because just based looking off of this, it doesn't look too, too bad. Um, but uh, normally you would expect that since the image resolution is a lot lower, you you probably would uh, get more like, challenging in terms of like assessing the microscope. exactly like the precision exactly. Okay, thanks. All right, do you guys have other questions? Or... All right, so we have uh, questions from the audience. Mm -hmm. Slash question. Yeah. When I spend the shame to turn it to clear, I really like the method, like having these microscopy images, then not processing directly that, but passing, having this step of quantifying the data first, so very clean, quantifying data, then the 